Coming up on this Friday edition of Daybreak, Russia's foreign minister says President Putin is ready to hold a summit with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. Furious with the UN vote condemning it for human rights abuses, North Korea threatens to conduct more nuclear tests. South Korea says such a move will be met with a stern response. Plus, Britain urges Russia to shut down a webcam spying site that offers live feeds peering into bedrooms and offices around the world. Daybreak begins now. Hello and thanks for joining us to our viewers around the world. It's 6am on Friday, November 21st here in Seoul. I'm Mark Broom and you're tuned in to Daybreak. And we start this morning with news that Russian President Vladimir Putin has expressed his willingness to hold a summit with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. Speaking to reporters on Thursday after closed-door talks with Kim's special envoy, Cher Yong-hae in Moscow, Russia's foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, said Moscow was ready for the highest level of contact with North Korea. Lavrov added that both sides will hold talks to arrange a suitable date for the summit. The Russian minister also said North Korea expressed a willingness to return to the long-stalled six-party talks on its denuclearization without any preconditions. Turning now to North Korea's angry response to the passage of a UN draft resolution which calls for the regime to be held responsible for grave human rights violation. Pyongyang completely rejected the UN committee's decision to bring the measure to the full UN General Assembly and says it's going to make moves to strengthen its nuclear deterrence and that could mean further nuclear tests. Our Lee ji reports. North Korea is angry and is now threatening to conduct more nuclear tests. On Thursday, Pyongyang's foreign ministry issued a statement strongly rejecting a United Nations draft resolution that refers North Korea to the International Criminal Court for Crimes Against Humanity. Calling it a U.S.-led attempt to overthrow the North Korean regime, the ministry said it will no longer refrain from conducting nuclear tests. And it looks like Pyongyang is getting ready to back up its words with action. Satellite imagery taken this month suggests that the North might actually be preparing to reprocess nuclear fuel into weapons with bombing capabilities. Analysis done by the U.S. Research Institute, 38 North, says the plutonium production reactor at the North's Yongbyon nuclear facility has been shut down for 10 weeks. As to why the reactor was shut down for longer than it needs to be, the institute says that the North seems to be replacing spent fuel rods and preparing to reprocess them. The imagery also shows steam coming from a cooling tower that's consistent with maintenance, testing and other activities that take place before operations begin. Analysts point out, however, that Pyongyang has gone down this path before. Its nuclear reactors were shut down in 2007 under a disarmament agreement. But last year, North Korea restarted them. Lee Jun, Arirang News. And the South Korean government has warned North Korea that the international community will sternly deal with the regime if it makes good on its threat of going ahead with another nuclear test. If North Korea aggravates the situation with nuclear threats towards the international community, it will be considered a violation of the United Nations Security Council resolution. We warn North Korea that it will face a firm response from the international community. And Washington also expressed its regret over Pyongyang's threat uh, to strengthen its military deterrence, as you can see there in that statement. Now, South Korea is formulating a plan of action over the recent disappearance of a North Korean student in Paris. Seoul's foreign ministry says it's in close consultations with French authorities to uh, assess the credibility of the case in order to see what needs to be done next. The student, only identified by his family name Han, has been missing for more than two weeks. 
There's speculation he's on the run after North Korean agents tried to make uh, an attempt to forcibly repatriate him. Han's father, an aide to Jang Song Tech, a once leading figure in the regime, is believed to have been purged recently. There are fears Pyongyang is attempting to rub out anyone with connections to Jang, who was executed late last year on charges of treason. The South Korean government has installed Ebola detection devices at the inter-Korean Kaesong Industrial Park. Officials from Seoul's Unification and Health Ministries say three thermal scanners have been set up on the North Korean side of the immigration office there. This follows a request made by the North late last month. South Korean officials will train North Korean staff at the park how to operate these devices. The machines, which cost more than 13,000 US dollars each, will be lent to North Korea free of charge. Now, President Park Geun-hye has asked the ruling party leadership to swiftly pass bills aimed at boosting the domestic economy. This includes ratifying free trade agreements with Australia, Canada, China, and New Zealand. The president also talked about what was discussed at the G20 summit in Brisbane last weekend. She said Korea's economic innovation plan was very heavily praised, but added that political support, uh, support rather, and cooperation is crucial for revitalizing the economy and uh, improving the people's livelihoods. Also up for discussion was a bill on reforming the public employee pension system and next year's budget. The ruling party floor leader in response vowed to make sure the livelihood related and budget bills pass parliament before the December 2nd deadline. Now, in a little under three weeks' time, leaders from 10 ASEAN countries will be right here in Korea for a special meeting with President Park. The event will be held to celebrate the 25th anniversary of Korea's relations with ASEAN. Our Hwang sang reports. The 2014 ASEAN ROK Commemorative Summit will kick off in Busan on December 11. The two-day meeting invites leaders from 10 Association of Southeast Asian Nations member countries like Myanmar and the Philippines. Up for discussion are ways to expand cooperation between Korea and the ASEAN countries, as well as global issues such as climate change and disaster relief measures. Since establishing diplomatic ties in 1989, ASEAN has become Korea's second largest trade partner and investment destination. The region is also one of the most popular vacation hotspots, with over 4 million Koreans visiting the bloc every year. The commemorative summit is expected to further bolster the relationship. Last year, President Park Geun-hye proposed a vision for partnership for trust and happiness in defining Korea-ASEAN relations for the future. The commemorative summit will present a comprehensive blueprint to realize this goal and will be an opportunity to celebrate 25 years of a friendship between Korea and ASEAN. The leaders will engage in bilateral meetings and enjoy a welcoming dinner on the first day of the event. The ASEAN ROK Commemorative Summit will take place on the second day, followed by a joint press conference. Hwang sang Arirang News. We start before the sun rises to bring you the latest stories out of Korea. We also lead the way with important global coverage. Stay on the pulse of what is happening with Daybreak. Now, to some rather grim news about the Korean economy, uh, deflation woes are mounting here in the nation, and local research institutions are continuing to slash Korea's economic growth forecast for this year and also the next and they say inflation will continue to stay in just the 1% range next year, which is lower than the government's outlook of 2%, which is already pretty low. Our Song ji Sun has this report. Slow growth and low inflation are making it hard for its hold to reach its growth forecast this year. Korea's economic recovery has lost momentum since April's deadly ferry disaster, 
which dented domestic sentiment, and it appears a trend may continue well into next year. In July, Seoul slashed its growth forecast for this year from 4.1 to 3.7 percent. But that's still higher than the market median, which stands at 3.5 percent, according to financial data released Thursday. It's the same story for next year's growth outlook. While the Korean economy is expected to grow at a relatively faster rate compared to this year, the Korean government stands alone with a forecast of 4 percent, with others expecting the figure to fall in the 3 percent range. The inflation forecast for next year from private institutions rests in the 1 percent range, nearly a percentage point below the government's outlook. That suggests the inflation will hover in the 1 percent range for the third consecutive year. Slowing domestic demand coupled with falling oil prices will only compound the issue, which may sound like a good news for consumers, but not in the long run. Once prices continue to fall, both consumption and investments shrink on expectations they will fall even more, leading to further deflation. To avoid such a recession, the government must facilitate the domestic economy in a way that boosts both growth and prices. A weak Japanese yen, slowing growth in China, as well as an end to U.S. quantitative easing are also casting a shadow on the Korean economy as downside risks for the coming year. Song Ji-sun, Arirang News. Now, for the first time in a very long time, Koreans are spending more on European brand cars than Korea's automakers make exporting their vehicles overseas. In particular, sales of German brands like BMW, Audi and Mercedes-Benz have gone through the roof after Korea's free trade deal with the EU came into effect a few years back. Now, Shin Se-min reports. Years ago, European automakers called Korea an impossible market to crack. But this year, European exports to Korea are on a path to exceed Korean exports to Europe. The nation's customs data shows the value of car imports from European countries was up 60 percent to over four and a half billion U.S. dollar in the first nine months of the year, whereas Korea's car exports stood around 4.4 billion. Local sales of European cars have been on the rise, becoming so popular that some auto retailers had to turn away customers because of low supplies this year. So why is this shift in consumers' taste? Better gas mileage bought me. The comfort of the ride is much higher, not to mention its widely known brand power. And the lowered price tax for these wheels, driven by the Korea-EU free trade agreement that went into effect in 2011, brought more drivers to lean towards European brands. Just this year alone, foreign car sales in the country rose over 33 percent, while local automaker Hyundai only saw a 3 percent increase. And over in Europe, the depreciation of the Japanese currency has affected Korea's footing. The performance of Korean automakers in the European market is falling, and this trend is likely to continue. Even Hyundai and Kia Motors, which have manufacturing plants located in Europe for a better supply to the local market, are losing ground because of lowered competitiveness due to the weak yen. But as the global auto industry is moving towards green cars, the analysts added Korean car makers should look to improve their advanced technology features if they don't want to fall too behind the competition. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. Now, Korea's elite group of uh, so-called super-rich has grown this year. The World Ultra Wealth Report, published by Swiss Wealth X and financial firm UBS, says 80 more Koreans with a net worth of 30 million U.S. dollars or more have been added to the super-rich list, bringing the country's total to just under 1,500. Their combined worth reached $280 billion, and roughly four out of the ten are self-made millionaires. They didn't make their money through inheritance. By country, the United States maintains its position on top of the list. Korea ranked 23rd. Now, shifting gears now, for most people, searching for a bit of R&R &R would not involve a stay in a prison, not at all. But a new program for self-healing has been launched in Korea that, surprisingly enough, 
involves some simulated incarceration. For more on the a retreat where you can't help but be uh, disconnected from the outside world, our Park Ji Won reports. People from all corners of the country arrive at this center in the county of Hongchan, about two hours to the east of Seoul, for a couple of days of rest and relaxation. They change their clothes and turn in their personal belongings, including their mobile phones. Participants learn how to relax their bodies and meditate at a mountain. However, that's not all. This program is called Prison Inside Me, and there's a reason. The most special feature of the program is that participants spend the night in this prison cell alone. In this setting, totally disconnected from the outside world, people can access their deepest state of mind and relieve stress while reflecting on their own lives in peace and quiet. The center offers dozens of rooms that resemble prison cells, where people willingly lock themselves up to ponder their lives without distractions or interruptions. Since the center opened last year, several hundred people have stayed here. I feel more somber as all the distracting thoughts inside me disappear, as I empty my mind. But why prison? I first came up with the idea when I was working as a prosecutor. I was totally exhausted and wanted to spend some time alone in prison to rearrange my life. It said everyone has their own prison inside them and that they live under its influences. We hope this program gives people time to reflect about the restraints they live under and how to free themselves from them. For those seeking to regain a balance in life again, a couple of days outside of their ordinary lives can provide a restart button for their weary minds and bodies. Park ji Arirang News. Time now for a look through the global headlines we're following on this Friday morning here in Korea. For that, we turn to our Eunice Kim, standing by at the News Centre. Good morning, Eunice. And good morning to you, Mark. Negotiations are in full swing in Vienna as a deadline looms to reach a deal on the Iranian nuclear program. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry arrived in Vienna Thursday evening to meet with his Iranian counterpart. And earlier in Paris, he said he was quite confident with the groundwork being laid ahead of the Monday deadline, adding that there is no talk of an extension yet. Representatives from six countries, the U.S., U.K., China, Germany, France and Russia have been engaged in talks with Iran for more than a year to set limits on Tehran's nuclear program in exchange to ease or end economic sanctions that have crippled its economy. One of the conditions in discussion is permission for an IAEA probe team to investigate the program to confirm that Iran, in fact, was not using it to develop nuclear armed missiles. A website based in Russia is streaming images from thousands of webcams worldwide. The BBC reports the website's database listed thousands of personal feeds from 152 countries, including baby monitors, bedroom cameras, and gym CCTVs. Nearly 4,600 listings were from the U.S., and there were also others from developing countries like Pakistan and Zimbabwe. The U.K.'s information minister is urging Russian authorities to take immediate action to take down the site, threatening international action if it does not cooperate. The website says it wanted to spotlight poor user security and was not breaking any rules. Experts urge webcam users to ensure a secure password is set on all devices connected to the Internet to avoid being hacked. 
And on the topic of hacking, a Swedish appeals court has upheld an arrest warrant issued by a lower court to extradite WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange for questioning. Assange is wanted in Sweden after two women there accused the 43-year-old for sexually assaulting them. Assange has been denying the charges and his lawyers have argued an extradition to Sweden would lead to an extradition to the U.S., where he faces charges of leaking government government documents. And in this latest case, lawyers had argued the 2010 detention order should be canceled because it could not be enforced while he was in the Ecuadorian embassy. Amid sub-freezing temperatures, a group of protesters clashed with police equipped in riot gear on Wednesday night as tensions rise ahead of a grand jury ruling that will decide whether a white officer will be charged for killing an unarmed black 18-year-old. Michael Brown was shot dead by Officer Darren Wilson on August 9th, sparking widespread outrage in the community. In the latest run-in, about 50 police officers charged at the smaller group gathered outside the Ferguson police headquarters, arresting five people, including an activist journalist. The grand jury decision is expected as early as Friday. And TGI Friday, everyone, as we kick things off with the second stage of the 2014-2015 ISU Speed Skating World Cup, which kicks off in tennis starting today. And what a treat it's going to be for the fans here in the nation. Of course, with the international competition returning to Korea for the first time in 10 years, it's going to be a star-studded event for the next three days as 10 Olympic gold medalists are set to compete in the second stage of the competition. And for the fans here in the nation, the event will be free of charge as they'll be able to watch some of the best in the world in speed skating. Meanwhile, highlighting the first day will be Olympic champion Lee Sang Hwa squaring off against Park Seung Hee, who recently switched to speed skating after a successful career as a short track skater. And now moving over to the Korean national football team will return to Korea on Thursday after finishing their November schedule with one win and one loss. And for head coach Uli Stilke, there's still a lot of work to be done. Now after their matches against Jordan and Iran this month, manager Uli Stilke's current record stands at one, uh, two wins and two losses so far with the national team. And as he prepares for the upcoming Asian Cup in January, the 60-year-old head coach stated that he will choose from the 28 players he's seen so far. With the lack of offense being a problem for the national team manager, Uli Stilike hopes to change all that as he's expected to bring the team back together mid-December in preparations for the upcoming Asian Cup. And now shifting over to baseball, where after SK Wyvern's Kim Gwang Hyun was posted for $2 million by the San Diego Padres, Kia Tigers ace Yang Yan Jung was posted earlier this week. And this weekend, his highest bidder will be revealed. Now, with the MLB office receiving Young's intention of being posted on the 18th, several MLB teams are said to be bidding on the lefty pitcher, with the highest bidder set to be revealed this weekend on the 22nd. And while Kim Gwang Hyun was posted for a rather low fee of $2 million, Young's posting fee is expected to be around $4 to $5 million, with teams like the Boston Red Sox and the New York Yankees showing interest in the pitcher. Now, staying in baseball, shortly after Yankee legend Mariano Rivera visited Korea last week, another Major League legend in Randy Johnson came to Korea on Tuesday as part of his tour to visit some of the servicemen here in Korea. But on Thursday, he wrapped up his tour in the nation as he made a trip to the Panmunjom, the defective border between North and South Korea, as he added a picture on his SNS page posing in front of the Bridge of No Return, calling it a surreal moment. Now, nicknamed the Big Unit, he finished his career with 303 wins with 4,875 strikeouts, winning five Cy Young Awards in 22 years in the majors. And that's going to wrap it up for me. This has been SJ. Have a great rest of the day and see you guys again for your sports needs.
Good morning. Well, it will be milder than yesterday. I mean, even right now, the temperatures mark at about 6.5 degrees Celsius here in Seoul, and that's about 3 degrees higher than yesterday. And top temperatures will also rise higher today, rising mid to upper teens in many areas. Well, a few clouds will be passing by, but skies will stay sunny for the most of the time, leading to a pleasant Friday afternoon. But light rain is expected for the capital area from the evening hours, but it should be a spotty one. With that in mind, let's take a closer look at the readings for today. Now, the daily low in Seoul started out at 5, then the daytime high will rise to 14, while Taewoo and Gwangju top out at 16 and 15, and Busan will climb to 18 this afternoon. And as for the other regions, Jeju Island and will be getting up to 16, and Daejeon and Dukdo will see highs of 15 this afternoon. Well, that's all I have for you at this hour. Let's send it back to Mark in the studio. Well, thank you ever so much for the weather, Gian. And that's going to do it from us for now. Korea Today is coming up at the top of the hour, 7 a.m. Korea time. Have a great day. Goodbye.